As I'm sure many of you in the audience know, I take care of children. And as Dr. Schreiner just told you, children have a bigger problem than adults do because they are getting adult diseases at younger ages, which means more years of decreased productivity, more years of medication, more years of morbidity, and decreased inability to pay into the tax system. Medicare will be broke by the year 2026. And it's not because the old people are sucking it up. It's because the young people are sucking it up. And so we have to fix this problem as early as possible. The question is, when do you intervene? Do you intervene at the teenager? Do you intervene at the child? Well, we have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. They don't diet and exercise. We have an epidemic of obese newborns. Four studies around the world, Israel, South Africa, Russia, the United States. Birth weight's gone up 200 grams in every one of those countries over the last 20 years. And when you do DEXA scanning to look at what the body composition of those 200 grams are, it's all fat. So kid, babies are being born fat. You want to say that this is personal responsibility. You want to say this is their fault. You know, I have a real problem with that. I'm a pediatrician. You know, we're all in this room because we recognize that obesity is more than what the out people out there think it is. Okay, and I'm going to tell you it's even more than that. And let's see if we can get started with that. So my charge is to ask, is fast food addictive? Well, the lay public seems to know this question. And if the fast food is addictive, then we've got a problem in terms of just being able to alter the environment so that people don't have the uh, impetus to eat it. You know, uh, one, one standard mantra that people use is, you wouldn't let an alcoholic work in a bar. You know, why would you let an addicted kid to fast food out, you know, at his own school cafeteria? Because that's what they're serving him. So here's how it all lines up in the brain. Everybody's familiar with these pathways, at least in uh, cursorily. We have, um, let me see which way is the, uh, oh, there it is, okay. So this is where I spend most of my time over here in the hypothalamus. This is the hunger area, if you will. And you'll notice there's a leptin receptor, and we're gonna talk a lot about leptin here in a moment. But over here is the reward area, the dopamine containing cells in the VTA, and there's a leptin receptor there as well. Now, all of these ultimately impact on reward generation at the nucleus accumbens, and then throw on top of that all of this cognitive restraint that you've heard about in the last couple of uh, uh, hours, uh, particularly out of the amygdala and its role in terms of the stress and fear response driving cortisol, which also drives appetite and changes the meaning of reward. So this is sort of your limbic control center for uh, basically going hog wild. So we have to understand what happens. Now, dopamine has been mentioned several times now, and you're all aware that as you become obese, dopamine receptor, dopamine D2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens go way down, and it doesn't matter which species you look at. Basically, this is the neurochemical uh, uh, correlate of the phenomenon of tolerance. Okay? Fewer receptors, you need more ligand to bind to fewer receptors, that's tolerance. And then when you try to withdraw it, you get physiologic symptoms, that's withdrawal. The good news is that the DSM-5 has removed withdrawal from its criteria for uh, addiction, so we can now make a much easier case that fast food is addictive. The question is, what about fast food is addictive? So let's tr talk about how these hormones ultimately impact on this phenomenon of addiction. So we're going to talk about leptin and insulin in order to understand this. So here is the energy balance pathway, and I'm just going to take it th through, through with you just very briefly. So here are four hormones here in blue. The ghrelin is the hunger hormone, comes from the stomach, tells your brain you're hungry. You put food in the stomach, ghrelin goes down. Peptide YY comes from the small intestine, but the end of the small intestine it goes to the brain, says, that's it, the meal's over, that's satiety. These are minute-to-minute -minute afferent inputs to the brain that basically control timing and size of specific meals, but it does not control adiposity or metabolism. That's left to these two hormones over here, leptin and insulin. 
Now, leptin, of course, is a hormone made by your adipocyte, travels in the bloodstream, goes to the hypothalamus, and says, hey, I have enough energy on board right now. I have enough energy I can burn as I need to, and also I have some that's saved up for a rainy day. So when your brain sees the leptin signal, all is right with the world. Then you have this other hormone called insulin, and insulin is really quirky because insulin does two things at once, and they're two exactly opposite things at once. So a pancreas releases insulin, and insulin tells your fat cell, store, that's the energy storage hormone opening up the uh, gateway at lipoprotein lipase to get energy into fat cells. Yet what it tells the brain, at least acutely, is, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing a meal. I don't need any more. So it's actually part of the satiety signal. So it's telling the fat cell, store, and it's telling the brain, stop. Two separate dichotomous effects all at the same time, which when you're insulin sensitive, works great. Unfortunately, what happens when you're not? And that's where obesity falls apart. So here's what leptin does. You eat a cookie, your fat cells accumulate some adipose tissue, your adipose tissue makes leptin, your leptin goes to your central nervous system and stimulates the sympathetic nervous system tone to increase sympathetic activity, which then goes via the beta-3 adrenergic receptor to cause lipolysis. And so what you have here is a nice yin-yang negative energy balance pathway between the adipocyte, the brain, and the autonomic nervous system to keep you in relative energy balance. And this works very nicely. Insulin, however, does the opposite. Here's what it does. First four things on this list, it stimulates energy transport into fat and then energy production into fat. So it stimulates GLUT4, the glucose transporter sitting on the outside of the fat cell, allowing the glucose to come in. It stimulates acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the first step on the way to fatty acid synthesis. It stimulates fatty acid synthase, the last step on the way to fatty acid synthesis. And it stimulates lipoprotein lipase, that enzyme that snarfs lipid off circulating lipoproteins and throws it into the fat cell for storage also. So here are four fat storage phenomena that insulin's in charge of. Worse yet, here's the fifth. And this is where the action is. Because what insulin does at the brain is it suppresses sympathetic tone. And therefore, you reduce hormone-sensitive lipase in that fat cell, and that keeps your fat cell from releasing your fat. So leptin makes fat, I'm sorry, I'm sorry leptin uh, releases fat and insulin stops it. Insulin is the leptin blocker. Insulin stops leptin signaling. And that's the key to obesity and understanding it. When you understand that insulin's the bad guy in the story, everything else comes from that. So we were faced many, many years ago with a dilemma. We had kids who had brain tumors. Their, at the area of their brain, their leptin was uh, tra signal transduction mechanism was knocked out. They couldn't see their leptin. Their brains thought they were starving. They were just like OB mice, except they had leptin. And they sat on the couch and ate Doritos and slept. And it was my charge when I worked at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital many years to take care of all of these massively obese kids who had craniopharyngiomas and hypothalamic astrocytomas and uh, uh, brain tumors like that. And so what we did was we took advantage of the physiology of the beta cell. So here's glucose coming in and here's insulin coming out. And the thing that tells the beta cell, how much insulin to come out is this voltage-gated calcium channel right over here. So when the calcium rushes in, activates calmodulin and causes vesicle extrusion, in this case insulin. And so glucose and insulin are yoked together through all of this uh, depolarization and channeling opening over here. What we did was we gave these patients this drug here called octreotide which binds to this somatostatin receptor, which then inhibits that voltage-gated calcium channel from opening. And the question was, if we did that, could we reduce the amount of insulin released, and could these patients lose weight? That was the goal. And we did this in two double-blind placebo-controlled trials in children, and then we did it in two double-blind placebo-controlled trials in adults without brain tumors. And lo and behold, patients lost weight. A lot of patients lost weight, but something even more remarkable occurred. They started exercising spontaneously. 
out of the blue. Patient number one, okay, I, the kid had been on uh, octreotide for one week, hadn't lost any weight yet. Mother calls me up on the phone, says, Dr. Lustig, I don't know what's going on, but something's happening. I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to end up, you know, having to explain this to the IRB, you know. <laughs> You know, adverse event already, first patient, I, I, you know, my, my career's over. I said, what, what happened? She says, well, before we would go to Taco Bell and she would eat five tacos and an enchirito and she'd still be hungry. Well, we just went to Taco Bell and she ate two tacos and she was full and she just vacuumed the house. <laughs> I said, really? What does she charge? <laughs> In Memphis, that was, you know, anyway. <laughs> anyway, bottom line, all of the kids started exercising spontaneously. And the reason was because they weren't storing it. They had it to burn. It changed their behavior. The change in the biochemistry changed the behavior. The biochemistry came first. Now, that is the exact opposite of the standard mantra that everyone else outside this room will promulgate. And that is exactly why you're in this room now, is because you guys are the out-of-the-box guys. And that's what you have to understand is, this is all biochemical. Let me show you. We did this then to a bunch of adults, and we did it in a pilot and then double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So we gave octreotide to 44 massively overweight, morbidly obese adults, and look what happened. Eight patients lost a lot of weight and BMI, eight. Eight out of the 44, not all, I agree. These guys, not so much. Some gained, okay? These high responders, who were they? Was there anything post hoc that we could learn about them that would help us understand this? First thing that happened was their diet changed. So here's their fat intake, and here's their protein intake over the six months of the trial, no difference. But look at their carbohydrate intake. The patients who responded dropped their carbohydrate intake on a dime. They went from 900 calories a day in carbohydrate to 350 calories a day in carbohydrate. They stopped snacking between meals. They stopped eating chocolate chip cookies. They stopped drinking sodas. We didn't tell them to do that. They just did it. And as a total, as a percent of total calories, they went from 47% of calories as carbohydrate down to 35% of calories as carbohydrate. Now, this is not anorexia. This is change in macronutrient food preference. And everyone knows that every obese patient out there is a carboholic. That is what they tell you they're seeking. That's what they're searching for. And of course, the food industry is very happy to give it to them. And we were able to basically sh stop their carboholism on a dime by lowering their insulin. So let me show you how we lowered. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I took the slide out about the insulin. Here's a patient, Christmas 1998, and here she is six months later in her jogging togs showing me she actually likes to exercise. I didn't tell her to exercise. She wanted to exercise because when you're not storing it, it's available for burning and you feel better doing it. So here's how we put the whole thing together as a model. And this is, I think, a model that works not just for kids but for adults as well. So here's obesity down here. And obesity, of course, those fat cells make leptin. And the leptin's supposed to tell your hypothalamus you've got enough energy on board to engage in normal, expensive metabolic processes so you can burn it off. But you don't. And the reason is because the insulin blocks the leptin signaling. And there are many studies now from many investigators, both basic science and clinical investigators, that show very specifically that hyperinsulinemia blocks leptin signaling through signal transduction mechanisms on the POMC neurons, such as SOX3 and SH2B. And I don't have time to explain what those bridges are, but they are. So if you're leptin resistant because of hyperinsulinemia, your brain thinks you're starving. And if your brain thinks you're starving, your sympathetic nervous system tone is going to go down. Your energy expenditure is going to go down. So you're going to sit on the couch. That's going to low physical activity, which only will contribute to further insulin resistance. In addition, your vagus nerve, and Dr. George yesterday talked about the vagus nerve and stimulating it to actually remove food cravings. We have seen the same thing. When we get in the way of the vagus nerve, as we did with the octreotide, by blocking insulin secretion, we got these people to alter their food cravings. And so this insulin hypersecretion drives hyperinsulinemia as well. So you have a little feed-forward loop here when you're leptin-resistant. 
On this side, you have instead the leptin should be suppressing, you should be extinguishing reward at the level of the nucleus accumbens. That's one of the things that leptin does, is it makes reward less rewarding. Okay? And that should reduce appetite for all of these things. But it doesn't because the hyperinsulinemia blocks leptin signaling at the nucleus accumbens as well. And this is work from Ralph de Leon at Yale. Add on top of that, the cortisol from stress from the amygdala, which drives insulin resistance as well, and is a direct uh, uh, obesogen stimulating appetite. And you can see, we call this the limbic triangle, because once you get in, you can't get out. And the bottom line is, in order to be successful for obesity therapy, you have to be able to parse each patient. Is their problem hunger? Is their problem reward? Or is their problem stress? How do they work together? And can we provide specific therapies that will deal with each of these in order to get the insulin down? Last minute. What about sugar, specifically? Is fast food addictive? And what about fast food is addictive? So everybody knows this book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us by Michael Moss. He left something out. He left out caffeine. Okay, now we're talking fast food. So what do we know about fast food and addiction? Caffeine's addictive, no argument. Fat is not. The Atkins people are doing just fine, thank you. And salt is not. It's habituating, but it's not addictive. And the reason we know that is because we have patients in pediatric endocrinology who have a disease called 21-hydroxylase deficiency, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. They lose salt from their kidney like crazy. They crave salt like crazy. But when you get their hormone uh, replacement on board, the salt craving goes away. So we know that we can modulate it when we fix the homeostatic problem. So salt is, not, is habituating but not addictive. Fat is habituating but not addictive. Yes, caffeine's addictive. What about sugar? So direct effects of the reward system. One slide. I, Dr. Ravina will do much more of this in her talk, I have no doubt. This is the one slide. Anybody know what this is? Anybody ever seen it before? It's a binky, but what's next to the binky? Anybody know what that is? That's got a name. It's called Sweeties. Sweeties. This is a super concentrated sucrose solution that you dip the binky in and then put it in the newborn boy's mouth before you do the circumcision. Okay? The moil does it with wine, okay? And everybody else does it with this. Okay? You are eliciting a reward and a narcotic effect in the brain of newborns by doing circumcision, okay? So need I say more about the reward aspects of sugar and how this might ultimately foment into addiction? And, of course, the big issue. Why are we so sugar-laden? Well, here's what's happened to the money. 1982 to 2012, we've all lived through this, meets down 10% because we were all told to go low fat. Fruits and vegetables, exactly the same. You know, we're always told to eat our fruits and vegetables, right? Five servings of fruits and vegetables. Guess what? You know, we're eating exactly the same as we were before. Grains and baked goods, up a percent. That's important because that makes your insulin go up too. Dairy products, 13.2 down to 10.6 because now we're all lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, here's the big kahuna right here. Processed foods and sweets, 11.6, 22.9%. This is what's happened over the last 30 years, and we have allowed it to happen It's with our tacit approval because we go out and buy the stuff. This is the food environment we now find ourselves in. And again, if you're an alcoholic, you wouldn't expect to be able to fix somebody if they worked in a bar. Well, if you've got an obese patient, you can't expect them to be able to fix the problem in our current food environment when we have specific substances that are addictive, that drive insulin up, prevent leptin from working, and continue the process of weight gain. That's where we are. That's what has to change. With that, I will thank my colleagues and sit down.